Hello, this is Mossy Maiden and welcome to the game Would You Rather. This is a game where we ask each other questions and you have two possible answers and you choose the one that you would obviously rather do. And now I'm going to uh, introduce it to David who is going to introduce the boys. Today we are here with Brian, Shamey, Kean, Connor and Ulton and obviously Mossy as well and they will be answering the questions that we have throughout this episode. Right, so the first question we have is, would you rather save 10,000 people across Ireland that you do not know or save 20 of your closest friends? I'm going to ask Mossy what he would rather do first. Okay, so personally now I would rather save 20 of my own friends because I'm very selfish, but I know most people would choose to save 100,000, but I really don't care. Uh, I'd pick 20 as well because I don't know 10,000 people, so there's nothing to do with me. So the next question we have is, would you rather wet the bed in your friend's house or poo the bed at your own house? Me, personally, I would rather wet the bed at my friend's house. I'm going to pass you on to Connor and see what he has to say about it. I would also rather wet the bed in my friend's house because like, you wouldn't have to clean that up. It would be your friend's job. <laughs> Right, so now we have another question, and it is, would you rather relive the same day for the rest of your life or wake up every morning and not remember what you did the day before? I'm going to ask Shamey what he has to say about it. I'd rather uh, relive the same day over because I'm boring like that and I really don't care about anything else. Uh, I think I'd wake up uh, not remembering the day before because you could do something different every day with your life instead of doing the same thing over and over again. Right, so we have our last question here, and it is, would you rather get paid 10 grand a month for doing absolutely no work or 30 grand a month for doing a job that you do not enjoy at all? I'm uh, going to let Mossy answer this first. Uh, I would pick the 10 grand uh, because I'd play sport instead. <laughs> I'd also pick the 10 grand one because if you pick the job one, your life's just be a misery doing the job you don't like. I'd pick the job one and then pay someone else to go in and do the jobs so you get more money. I'd pick the job one so I could splash the cash by the end of the year. I'd do the 30,000 one as well and just spend all the money. You'd have lots of money at the end of the year. So Right, so that's the end of our podcast. Some great answers there from the lads. And I'd just like to thank you for listening to Would You Rather. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the first and last ever episode of Conspiracy Crap, where we, where several uninformed people talk about conspiracies. Our first conspiracy of the day is that 9/11 was an inside job by the American government. 9/11 was real. It w- um, 9/11 wasn't real. 9/11 was done by Bush. No, 9/11 was real. Like no. there's several, was real. lots of because proof. just before Bush and his group of politics or his group of politicians, got into power. They said that they needed um, a policy change on the war in Afghanistan. And that policy change came about after the 9-11 towers were hit because everyone felt like they had to go and join the war in Afghanistan to fight Al-Qaeda because they were the ones who blew up the Twin Towers. But it was really all done by Bush so they could get more people to go fight in Afghanistan. But I feel like that America has gone far on, like, political, like, parts, but I don't feel like they'd go that far to kill their own citizens. Like, a thousand and a half people died in 9-11, and I don't think America would do that and wouldn't be able to cover it up well enough. That, like, that's a small price to pay, though, for a country as big as America with the population they have and the amount of people that are being born every second in America. Are you, and the, and and the point is they couldn't cover it up. That's why everyone knows this is real. And how many buildings do you think were destroyed during 9-11, the actual 9-11 itself? The Twin Towers. No, but that what, that's what the government are covering up because there was more than that being destroyed. Because, for example, Building 7, which I'm pretty sure that's what it's called, was no, it's just, extremely, it's con- like extremely controlled <laughs> destruction of the building, which collapsed from the top down. So, well, from the bottom down, really, from the bottom up. So it collapsed, started at the bottom, and the building collapsed down on itself, which is, if you've seen the video online, it is clear that it collapsed from the bottom up, which is really controlled explosion, and you could see that it was evident that the, the C4s on the bottom of it were remote control explosives when 
not when the planes collided with with the actual twin towers, it's clear that the controlled explosives were set off at that time. So it took away from what happened with the twin towers. It like the sorry, the twin towers took away what happened with Building Seven. So no one really was noticed that that happened because that building was cleared as well beforehand. Yeah, but it's still a plane hitting a building, so it's gonna fall. But like, what if Al Qaeda had to put some like bombs in it? What if it wasn't yeah, America? Yeah, no, but if they did put bombs in it, the point is they would admit to doing it because this is all a publicity stunt for them because they want to take credit for it. That's why whenever there's attack, sometimes there's attacks that they don't even do that they claim to just to get it. And the Pentagon, there was four planes hijacked that day. One of them was set for the Pentagon. And the one part of the building that wasn't occupied, that they, that's the part that they hit. And to hit that part, they had to do an extremely complicated turn, which only the best of pilots said they would have had trouble. Like, um... Maneuvering. Maneuvering, yeah. Um, they did that turn. And these four pilots that trained, the people who trained them, said that they were really bad pilots, which means that they obviously... How were they going to like complete this complicated term to hit the one part of the building that wasn't occupied in the building that was housing all of the orchestrators of this entire plan? I don't know, but like, 9-11 was like, a travesty and people still died in it, but like, moon landing, real or fake? Real. Fake. Real. I, it's real, there's, I've seen... I don't know if you've seen the pictures of Neil Armstrong's boots, for example, now just one example, but the... the Design well, not the design, but the way his boots are, they're flat, flat soled, and the markings of the footmarks and the footprints on the moon that have been shown are so different to the actual boot size and shape and design that the ones Neil Armstrong was videoed wearing after he landed from the, back from the moon. No, you see, I don't think that's true because, like, it's such an easy mistake to make. It's not like they're going to show him, like, say, set it up wearing different boots and then post those with pictures of him wearing another pair of boots. Like, the tracks could have been taken off of the boots. Like, that's yeah. so true. What I'm saying is, though, but, like, another thing I think is that the amount of... Like, I don't believe that at the time they had the sufficient technology and... Uh, to land on the moon like I'm not saying it's impossible for someone to land on the moon I'm saying that at the time I believe they didn't have the technology that would have allowed them to land on the moon in the first place that's not true because they literally they made an entire movie about the people who wrote the code to send them to the moon they had the technology there's evidence of the code I think it's about like six foot high or something of your one who wrote the code standing beside it Why, why would they just write all this code for an operation they never did like it's a, like the government go to extreme lengths to cover up things. Like they do, this is oh, proven. I agree like, with that, that, but they didn't cover this up because there's no. How, how what's the difference between this and any other event that covering up? Because this was like the first time in human history that a land, man landed on the moon. The rocket went off in Cape Canaveral. Like, where did the rocket go? It went to the moon. This was televised. There was people there watching it. it you could go and see it leave. At, but. At the time, so though, America, were, America seen that they were behind in the space race yeah. with Russia, yeah. and they were getting desperate. So they yeah. would have done any means necessary. They would have built a rocket and flown it into just the middle, of, just into space, and had it disappear, and have like these people go and just do this. But they would have gone to extreme lengths just to beat Russia in the space race. Like the, but the thing is, they were already beating Russia in the arms race, so they didn't have any ties. To but that, the moon exactly landing was real, so like that's all that matters. It's yeah. not. You can't. Okay, right. Well, we'll finish up there then. Uh, thanks for listening and goodbye. The definition of sport is an activity involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual or team competes against another or others. Welcome to Candid Conversations, where we talk about the stereotypes of different sports. We are trying to identify what makes certain sports considered more sporty than others. In Ireland, contact sports like GAA are traditionally considered more physical and sporty. But if a person says they do gymnastics, people think this is an easy sport and is not as physical and demanding as the GAA. Yeah, I agree. I've done gymnastics for 12 years and I just feel like people think it looks easy and that anyone can do it, but there's like a lot of training and a lot of skills needed to do it.
Uh, yeah, I've, I did athletics since I was about six. And I always kind of felt that as well because I never liked contact sports. I never felt like justified like, oh, you're not a sporty person because you don't do contact sports. Even though I trained just as much as anybody in any other contact sport did. Yeah, I feel like some people think if someone doesn't do the certain sport with a club, then they're not allowed to say that they play the sport because they don't, they're not registered with, say, a camogie club or an athletics club. They just do it by themselves. Yeah, I do swimming and I don't do it with a club or anything. I just go to the pool or the beach sometimes. And like when I say I do swimming, I feel like people think, oh, it's not that serious. Like, But it is actually really hard and you do have to like keep up your training if you want to swim well. Um, yeah, also with other arts like ballet, I do ballet and I'd always feel kind of embarrassed to say it because there's like a stigma around it and people just think anyone can do it. It's just like a little twirl here and there, but it's like really hard and the training's really hard and you get blisters and all that. I just feel like people don't think it's hard and people don't see it as anything that needs to be worked on. Do physicality and injury risks conclude whether a sport is more sporty? Well, the statistics do not support this. It shows that in GAA, 30% of all adolescent players develop one injury per year. However, in gymnastics, 50% of all adolescent gymnasts develop an injury per year. This is despite the fact that people think GAA is more dangerous than gymnastics. So in conclusion, I think it's not really fair to make your own opinions about other people's sports. Or to rank them based on how much effort you think is or isn't being put in. So this is the end of Candid Conversations. Thanks for listening. Bye. Yo, yo, yo. What's poppin', my boys? Welcome to the Triforce Podcast with Anto Bluey. Well. And also with Kino. Ostercrack. And myself, Todd. Today we'll be discussing one of the biggest conspiracies ever. And that's right, we're discussing Bigfoot. Until I hand this over to you. How's it going, my dude? Let's get into this. So, Bigfoot is a 10 foot tall Homo sapien. Wonder what's that like? Yeah, thank you, Anto. And Kino, what have you got to say? Bigfoot has been spotted in the region of North America. Typically around Montana and all over there. And trust me, you wouldn't want to get on the bad side of this funky monkey. Oh yeah, that's right, Kino. Bigfoot is said to have a bite force of like a thousand PSI. And I th- and I think I saw him last week in the street. Yeah, he was, he, I mean, he had a shirt on, but hey, you'll never know. Now, lads, do you think that Bigfoot is real? Because I do. Anthony? No. No? What about you, Kino? Nope. Well, I do. Why do you think that he isn't real? Because the photos on the internet could be just made up. Everything's made up on the internet. Well, like, you see pictures of, like, presidents on the internet, but that doesn't mean that they're not real. Kino? We've never seen any evidence that exists. There could be plenty of evidence, like, there could be footmarks in the ground, which definitely isn't left by hoaxers or anything, but, yeah, I think he's real, and you can't convince me otherwise. Oh, I think I can. Oh, really? Watch this. Welcome to Paranormal Stories. My name is Kirsten and I will be hosting today's talk discussing the topic of paranormal activity and whether it is real or not. My guests today are Leah Kenny, Chloe Mulcahy, and Amy O'Sullivan. What are your guys' thoughts on paranormal activity? Yeah, I believe in paranormal activities. Amy, do you? Uh, yeah, I believe them in it too. I think paranormal activity is your loved ones trying to contact you. <laughs> That's really interesting, Amy. Have you ever had any paranormal experiences? Um, yeah, my mom told me when I was younger that I used to look at a certain part of the ceiling in my sitting room and laugh as if I was seeing someone or something. What about you, Leah? 
Well, my dog stands in a corner in my living room sometimes and stares at nothing and he does be barking. So I believe that it could be something to do with paranormal activity and the spirits, but I'm not sure. That's a bit odd. What about you, Chloe? Do you have any stories? Um, yeah, I have a good few. I've had a good few of like chairs being dragged across the floor when no one's downstairs and the bathroom light um, turning on and off and then the handle going 90. Uh, my mum's heard someone running down the hall with the bare feet um, and my brother has also heard the same thing. Um, I also had a sister who passed before I was born so I never met her or anything um, but when I was smaller um, I picked out a photo uh, in my nan's house and said, oh, this is Emma, and my nan was in shock because no one has ever told me about my sister before then, or ever pointed her out. And then once me and my dad were talking about uh, my sister, and he was like, oh, do you have an image of her? And at the same time, we both said she had long brown hair, and he asked what length, and we both said shoulder length. Some great stories there. Thank you so much for listening. Hey, welcome to our podcast. Today we will be talking about a few topics, but mainly concentrating on the stigma of girls playing sports and the clicks in sports. All right, I think we should start with rules because it's a topic that everyone has an idea of. We all agree that the gender should be split when it comes to boys and girls playing together because there's obviously differences in builds and strengths. So the split almost acts like a safety measure, but the differences in rules in the sport makes little to no sense. As we were saying earlier, when girls are playing against the girls, everyone is only as able to use as much strength as their opponent. When the ref is constantly blowing the whistle for frees and fouls, the game just can't flow, which is a big turn off in my opinion. On that point, I think we should jump into the stigma of girls in sport in general. <laughs> I mean, PE is a very common area that not many people are aware of in regards to the difference in in performance ability in girls and boys. There's no hate aimed at lads because we know it's being done unknowingly, but we think it's definitely something to be aware of. For example, playing soccer or football, the lads tend to pass to lads and the girls are kind of left to the side and forgotten about. To girls, we don't really know if it happens deliberately or it's just a habit, but in class, it can sometimes create an intimidation for girls at sport itself and can sometimes turn them off it completely. Uh, I mean, support at games has a lot to do with that. Support at girls' games is desperate and there's no point sugarcoating that. Whereas at boys' games, there's barely enough room on the pitch for all the supporters. Like, girls' match tickets are very are way cheaper than lads, yet there's still next to no one at the matches. Other than family and friends, there's really no motivation for people to go and watch girls' games, even though it's nearly the exact same sport as the boys. I want to get on to the topic of favouritism. I know it's controversial, but I genuinely believe that if a parent can't put all emotion, connection and feelings towards their child aside and put your best team forward, they need to leave. Some coaches are able to do this, and I in particular have witnessed that firsthand, but in a lot of cases, the managers don't have the best interest for their team in their heart, but the best interest for their child. And this is so evident on county and club teams. I have actually played under that type of coach for years with the club who only trains us so their child can start, and it's wrong. Substitutes aren't given the opportunity to make their way onto a team because of the spaces that are taken up by players who don't deserve the spot. But this is just in my experience. I know plenty of players' children who are savage, but there's sometimes a few who are not good enough to make the cut and do. Yes, I agree. There's also a lot of pigeonholing in football, where no matter how hard you try and prove, the coach will always think of you as a sub. I mean, we are lucky to have managers who are willing to train us because, being honest, there's very little demand of people wanting to train female teams full stop. But I think a lot of that issue would be solved if some coaches were open to feedback and improvements, but overall open to change in general. Okay, guys, I think that's pretty much everything covered. Thanks so much for listening to Split Sport. (laughs) 